evolved, I guess, in our, in our sermon series on transcendent truths to key passages or key truths. And to one of those truths this evening is very, very simple, but it is one that I'm afraid uh, we as believers are either not interested in sometimes or we do not realize that it's something that's an opportunity for us to have. Okay, so let me just, uh, let's just begin reading. It just, we'll just read first. Verses 1 through 4, and we'll stop there this evening, and then we'll ask the Lord's help in our message tonight. Wisdom hath builded her house. She hath hewn out her seven pillars. She hath killed her beast. She hath mingled her wine. Uh, she hath also furnished her table. She hath sent forth her maidens. She crieth upon the highest places of the simple, of, I mean, of the city. Whoso is simple, let him come in hither. As for her turning hither, as for him that wanteth understanding, she saith unto him, or saith to him, let's pray. Now, Father, I pray that you would help us this evening to see the opportunity that's offered to anyone who wants to be wise. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, the truth of the matter is that tragically enough, uh, it is in our nature, in our inherent flesh, oftentimes to want for people to think highly of us, uh, even more so than we're concerned about God, thinking highly of us. You say, Pastor, that's for you and spiritual people. That's for people that, uh, you know, that uh, struggle in the flesh, which I do not. I always only care about what God thinks. And the question I have is, is it so? Is that so? I don't care what people think. We care what God thinks. Then why do you sin? Why do you sin? You know, most of the time, most of the time, uh, we know that the Bible simply answers the reason why we sin in James, that we're drawn away of our own flesh and enticed. And so the answer to why we sin is we want to, right? Exactly. But what motivates us to sin? I'll tell you, the respect of persons, the fear of men, or the desire uh, to please men. Uh, there's an age, I think, that is particularly vulnerable uh, of people that are just vulnerable to peer pressure. There's just an age where people seem to be particularly vulnerable to just almost living in everything that they do being for the peers or those that surround them. And I'm not saying everybody, but just people in particular. And I think the age ranges somewhere between birth and death. Somewhere in there. <laughs> you know, somewhere between being born and dying. And I've noticed that people care about what other people think about them from about the moment they're born until the moment they die. Matter of fact, philosophically, there are a lot of behavior modification methods that have to do with rewarding certain behaviors and discouraging other behaviors by not rewarding them. Rewarding them, and you know what that's all about? It's all about peer pressure, right? And uh, so, the fact is, is that you could say, "Well, pastor, that's you. That's you, carnal people. That's you, weak people." I'm not affected by peer pressure, but uh, most of us are. And that's, that's the reality of it. Probably, if you think you're not, you're probably less aware of it than you should be in your own life. Much of what we do is to please others. And because of that, oftentimes, we are not wise. We are not wise. Now, the book of Proverbs, if you were to ask me the question, what is the greatest source of wisdom? Well, we would say simply, God is, of course. And then we would say God's Word is the source of wisdom. And then after we would say God's Word is the source of wisdom, we would follow by saying as well, not only is God's Word the source of wisdom, but the wisdom books in the Bible are a great source of wisdom, that is Proverbs. Now, I will say this about Proverbs just to, to try to help you understand my perspective on it. Proverbs is not simply a list of wise sayings. In other words, I don't hold the wisdom literature in the scripture on the same level as I do Benjamin's, Benjamin Franklin's wisdom. You know, Benjamin Franklin said, a penny saved is a penny earned, right? He said, early to bed, early to rise makes a man healthy, wealthy, and wise. And you know something? Those things are pretty true. You know, you save a penny, you don't have to pay. If you already have it, it's already been taxed. It's a pretty valuable penny. You spend a penny that's already been taxed on, then you're going to get taxed on spending it, and it loses a lot of value. So a penny that you can hold on to is one that has quite a bit of value. And so Benjamin Franklin's right, but he's not inspired. 
but the Proverbs are inspired. Matter of fact, remember uh, just a couple of months ago, or maybe even just about a month ago, we had a message from Romans where we quoted uh, the uh, old, when where Romans quotes Proverbs when the Bible talks about uh, if your enemy's hungry, feed him, and if he's thirsty, give him water, drink, and so doing, he'll eat coals of water. Uh, coals of water. <laughs> it's been a long day for me, I guess. Coals of fire on his head. And uh, without looking at the explanation of passage of Scripture, Romans is quoting Proverbs as Scripture, as it is written, which indicates that Proverbs is not just wise sayings, it's the Word of God, and as valuable as the Word of God. I want to help you with something, friend. There are a lot of believers who want to circumvent or not do things exactly God's way, or they want to be able to say, I was perfect, and somewhere, you know, God wasn't good. And that's what it means when they say that. And they say, well, you know, Proverbs, you know, they're truisms. They're mostly true, but they're, you know, they're not inspired necessarily as always true. For instance, I know believers that will take Proverbs 22, 6, which says, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he'll not depart from it. And they say, well, that's a general truth. That's generally true. But I know great Christians who did a wonderful job raising their children, and their children turned out badly. I don't. I don't. I believe the Word of God. I believe to train up a child the way he should go when he's ill will not depart from it. And I don't know that people that think that they're perfect and that they've done everything perfectly can really be helped to do anything differently. See, it's a diagnostic scripture. It's a helpful one. If you have the humility to say, okay, we've got a problem, we've got a problem. So a lot of times I say, well, you know, I do everything right. I, I've done a perfect job raising my kid. I don't know why he's rebelling. Well, if you be honest about it, there's a reason. If you be honest about it, there's something. Yeah. There's something there, and the Word of God can help you with it if you admit that you aren't perfect. And so it's a book of wisdom, and it's a real help. And so let's go to some wisdom this evening, and I just want to just let you know that the Bible says that anyone can be wise, and I find that comforting. If you have ever been real enough in life to recognize that you're not the smartest person in the world, uh, you're, you're ahead of most. You know, being smart's a real help, but you know, have you, anybody ever met someone that's either a prodigy, a child prodigy, or borderline prodigy, prodigy like really, really exceptionally bright, way ahead of the curve of the average? Have you ever met a, a child who can function like an adult? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. Yeah. I haven't. I've never met a child who went to work, married a wife, supported oh, kids, <laughs> raised kids, uh, raised a family, and uh, shoulder responsibility like an adult. No, they're still children. In other words, they may be able to do math, or they may be able to play a piano, or they may be able to graduate from you know, an academic class that would be, you know, for the most part at the maturity level that adults would take, but they're still a child. You understand what I'm saying? Words, you can have a, a high IQ and still not be wise. You can have a high IQ and still not be what we call smart. The word in Proverbs chapter 9, verse 1, when it says, wisdom hath built in her house, the word for wisdom there is a, a word, hakamah. Hakamah. And it's kind of got a fa sound at the end, hakamah. And that word means skill. Skill. Um, this would in no way be a slight to him at all to use this illustration. I think he'd be proud to know he was mentioned this evening. Some of y'all remember some years ago Earl Balthaser in our church. How many of you guys remember Earl? And uh, Earl was born, he was born a blue baby. And uh, he was to some degree mentally deficient because of that. But he, he was raised by a loving family in, in Pennsylvania. And he was an apprentice, an apprentice to a clockmaker. And he used to take all the really, really fine, fancy clocks, all kinds, maybe the mantel clocks or the grandfather clocks, all the different ones. And he could take them apart to the little pieces. And he could machine uh, just beautiful little gears and bushings and he could put a clock together. He could take a clock completely apart and just put it all back together. Or you could take your clock apart and bring it to him in a box. And he could put it all back together. And he could tune and adjust it and get it to tell perfect time. And he could rebuild old German.
clocks and all those things. And uh, you know, Earl, um, intellectually, he wasn't wasn't so smart. Just wasn't so smart. But I tell you something, he could sure build a clock. And if I ever needed something, one time I remember I was working on a car that belonged to Brother Alex, and I was putting it was I was putting a timing chain in, and there was a little um, just a, a little pin that went into the engine block, and I lost it. I don't know. I think it sheared off. I think it was broken. It sheared off. And I remember going and finding the same kind of steel and taking it by Earl's place, you know, and he put it on his lathe and he turned it down. A perfect little pin. And he polished it and made it look nicer than any pin that General Motors ever put in an engine to begin with. And there were a few times like that. I said, hey, Earl, could you make me whatever? I mean, he just had skill. He just had skill. Now, Earl uh, might have gone to the eighth grade in school. Uh, he couldn't read. If he, if he had to go somewhere, you'd write the address down, and then you'd have to give him the address so he could show somebody, so they could take him there or tell him how to get there. He could memorize, he could remember how to get places, but he couldn't read. And he wouldn't tell people he couldn't read, so that'd be kind of tough sometimes. One time he got lost on his bicycle and he wanted me to come pick him up. And that was a little tough because. I said, well, what street, what's the street sign say? Well, he couldn't read the sign. Tell me what the letters say. He couldn't read the letters mm -hmm. on the street sign. So Earl wasn't exceptionally educated. He wasn't exceptionally bright, but he was skilled. I mean, there, there wasn't anyone else in the church who could take a clock apart and put it back together. Matter of fact, there aren't many clocksmiths left in the world. True. I mean, he could do watches, too. You know, the, the watches with the fine works and stuff. There's not many people that can work on those things. I mean, I'm not saying there aren't any. But there aren't many that can do that. And so he was skilled. It didn't mean he was exceptionally smart. He was skilled. Now, I'm not saying this evening that anyone is not intelligent. But all I'm saying to you is that if the Bible says that someone who isn't intelligent can be wise, I'm all ears. You hear me? Because I've realized a lot of times that I'm not the smartest guy. I've had people call me and say, Pastor, I've got a problem. I need help. I've been trying to figure this thing out forever, and I don't know what to do. And they're smarter than me. I've got to help them. You know what I need? I need wisdom. See, wisdom, the Bible says, hath built in her house, she hath hewn out her seven pillars. We know the number seven and its significance. She hath killed her beast, she hath mingled her wine, she hath also furnished her table. When I was in elementary school, I learned that this was personification. That is, taking a concept or taking it something inanimate and uh, making it like a person. And so wisdom here is a person. She's like a, a wise lady who has made her house. She's got seven pillars, and she's prepared a feast. She's... Uh, she's mingled her wine. Now the word wine here is fruit of the vine. It's not some alcoholic beverage. It's fruit of the vine, and she's made it some really great juice. And some special juice, some, you know, cranberry cocktail or something like that. I don't know what it is. But she's made some, some special juice, mingled her wine. And uh, she has, she, she killed the fatted calf. And she's cooked dinner. And her house is prepared. And there's an invitation given. Now, I don't know about you, they, these guys were talking about those uh, Brazilian steakhouses before the service. Now, the good thing about it is my mouth doesn't water when I hear about a Brazilian steakhouse because none of y'all have ever taken me to one of those. So, <laughs> I don't really know anything about it. But they're talking about Rodizios and places like that that they think are great meals. But i tell you, when I hear the description here that she has, she's, she's killed her beast, she's mingled her wine, I'm thinking... I'm thinking home cooked dinner here, and I don't care. I mean, if you got, if you have a lady who can do home cooking, I'm not telling you know some ladies just they they just do home cooking, and you could offer me you say you know such and such lady is going to do home cooking. So Mrs. Price, matter of fact, we've got two apple pies in our house tonight, homemade apple pies in our house, made by my sweet no made by my son Devin. I mean, did you make them, Devin? <laughs> but she's teaching Devin to make apple pies. No, that's a skilled young man. That's a wise young man. He's going to get a wife soon. He can make apple pie. So, anyway. <laughs> uh, oh, and Alyssa. Wow, okay. Alyssa and Devin made the pies. 
I hope they're good. They better be good. But if you were to tell me, hey, let's go to Rodizio's or let's go to a home cooked dinner, you all know Larry and Maria, right? Maria is one of those people. She's a cook. And matter of fact, <laughs> if Maria goes away for the weekend, she packs her kitchen. Like, I'm not kidding you. She packs her pots and her pans, and she has boxes with all of her seasoning. Oh, you know, Sophia's a cook, too. She's the Greek version. Maria's the Italian, French-Italian version, and Sophia's the Greek version. And if you, somebody says, uh, you can go to Rodizio's, or you could go, uh, or, or Maria's brought back pasta from Italy, and uh, she's going to make a seven-course family dinner from Italy. I'm going, I'm going to go to Maria's meal. I've never been to Rodizio's, but I'm just going there. Because it's home cooking. I mean, everything is made from scratch. The sauces, everything's fresh. Everything is real Italian. You know, like you can't get anywhere else. I had Sophia's one time, and she had she cooked Greek. What did we have that evening? Sophia, you remember what you cook? Was a lamb? Did you make leg of lamb? Chicken and lamb. Chicken, lamb, something like that. Both. Yeah. I mean, something both. like that. Anyway, she can cook too. And you say, oh, Rodizio's or Sophia's house? I'm going to Sophia's house. You know, and that's the way I feel about this invitation. Do you see the picture that, that Solomon is trying to paint here? Solomon is not trying to say, you know, there's, there's a trough and you can go down there and, and uh, belly up. He's saying, wisdom, have built your house. I mean, the atmosphere, seven pillars we're talking about, you know, a real fine place. And then the... the, the, the uh, the food is she's killed her beast, she's mingled her wine, she's furnished her table, and now she says, okay, girls, go out and invite them in. So she sends out her maidens to say, hey, go invite everybody in. And this is a whosoever will kind of a thing. Whoso, here's the, here's the qualification, whoso is simple. Whoso is simple. Now, simple um, is a really nice word of, that basically says what I think uh, and that the children aren't supposed to say. There's a word the kids aren't supposed to say. That I say, yeah, stupid. You said I. You said stupid. I said what you said. Okay. Uh, stupid. You're not supposed to say it. But wisdom. Uh, I mean, simple is a real nice way of saying not too bright. Just not too bright. Okay. And uh, wisdom is saying, whoso is simple, let him come in hither. As for him that wanteth understanding, you know, you ever met the I don't get it. When I was in high school, there was one class, Lee and I were in this class together, actually, ninth grade, it was Algebra 1, and there was a guy in our video class that we took named John. Remember John? You don't remember John? Jennifer Wilson remember John. There was a guy named John, and after, after the teacher explained the lesson every time, John would go to the microphone, he raised his hand, and because it was on video back then, they'd have to go to the back class, go to the microphone, John would go to the back microphone, and we would all say this together with him when he'd say it. He'd get the microphone, and he'd go, I'll understand it. Every time, we'd all say it together. It'd be like, yes, John. John would go to the back of the class, and he'd go, I won't understand it. I don't know if John passed the class or not. I don't know if I could pass the class or not. <laughs> uh, the Bible says, ask for him that wanteth understanding, she saith unto him. Now listen to me, Christian. Listen to me. Listen to me. Too many times we're okay with saying, I don't understand it, and then just quit. Too many times we're okay with saying, well, you know what, it's just a little bit too much for me. It requires too much wisdom. I can't deal with it, and we just walk away from it. But you know, life, life is for us to live. And by living, I'm not speaking of the Epicure, uh, Epicurean philosophy, where we just live for the pleasure of our flesh. No, life is meant to navigate I mean, if God put it in front of you, it's to get through and to be wise about. You know, a lot of times we as Christians, we hunker down or we turn away or we turn aside, but we don't live. Life's full of problems. There are commands in the Scripture that when it comes to practically obeying, you have to say, I don't understand it. I don't, I don't know how. There are things that require wisdom that we do not have, aren't there? Listen, how many parents would ever say, I got this? I mean, I've never spoken to a good parent who I, that I've just come in. I've just said, you know what? I can just tell God's blessing your family. You're doing a great job raising their, your kids. And I, to a, uh, to the, I don't know what you say, 
to, to a man, every single individual I've ever said that to has said, you know, Brother Price, I'll tell you what, I just pray for wisdom because, man, I'll tell you what, I don't have, when it comes to raising kids, you know, I just, I just have to pray for wisdom. It's got to have God help me. You know what? Evidently, God gave him wisdom. You see it? And so life is for us to live, folks, but a lot of times the problem is, is that we're either foolish or we're simple and we don't understand and we're okay with that. You know something? That isn't what God wants. The Bible says wisdom hath built her house, she hath hewn out her seven pillars, she hath killed her beast, she hath mingled her wine, she hath also furnished her table, she hath sent her maidens uh, in the streets. And, and she, they're crying, she's crying, saying, Whoso is simple, let him come in hither, let him turn in hither, as for him that wanteth understanding. She saith unto him, notice this. Here's a guy that doesn't know anything. She says, Come, eat of my bread, and drink of the wine which I have mingled. Now, if this isn't a picture of the way that Jesus presents the gospel, isn't it? Whosoever will, whosoever will may come. This is wisdom. This is wisdom. And my friend, I don't know about it, if it does it for you or not, but I get goosebumps. I get thrills just thinking. I'm part of this. This is for me. I and mean, this is whoso, uh, as for him that wanteth understanding, she said, then come eat my bread, drink of the wine which I have mingled. And then wisdom says, forsake the foolish and live. You say, Pastor, you've got to be smart enough to know who's not, not smart. My friend, just look at people that are facing consequences. Look at people facing consequences and figure out foolishness. Foolish. Look at people that aren't doing right, aren't living wisely. It isn't so complicated to find out who's foolish. You know, I could take the average second grade class, and I'm going to say in a Christian school. I could take the average second grade class in a school where the kids are uh, that where the kids are saved, they're born again, and where they're taught the Word of God as well as academics. And I can ask the second grade class and say, who's, who's the wisest child in the class? You know what? They probably arrive at the same person the teacher would. I mean, kids, kids know, you know, he's always in trouble. That's probably not him. You know, well, this person always, everything, you know, that, that's probably he or she, that's probably the one. That's probably the wisest one in class. You know, we're not applauding anybody or patting anyone on the back or exalting anyone to just say that we can say that we know who's foolish and who isn't. Can we? Isn't, isn't that pretty much common sense? We know who's foolish. And, and she says to the simple, to the one that wants understanding, she says, forsake the foolish and live. Forsake the foolish and live. My friend, wisdom is crying. She's saying, come on, come hither, come to me. Come, eat of my bread, drink of my wine. Come. And she's saying, push away. My friend, you can't be wise and walk with the foolish. You can't be wise and walk with foolish men. It's not possible. Now, does that mean that we can't preach the gospel to the foolish? Does that mean we can't help the foolish? No, we can't go in the way of foolish men. We can't walk with foolish men. We can't do what they do. We can't participate in them. And now here's some practical uh, some practical ap applications for wisdom, and we'll be finished. We're only going to go down to verse 12. Verse 7, the Bible says, He that reproveth a scorner getteth to himself shame, and he that rebuketh a wicked man getteth himself a blot. For some years now, there have been some pretty damaging doctrinal videos, some videos on, on the Internet. And Brother Tony has actually asked me several times, Pastor Price, would you respond to what this person is saying because of what they're saying? And my response to him is, no, I'm not going to. I'm not going to. I'm not going to mention their name. I'm not going to give them publicity. I'm not going to give them what they're looking for because they're a scorner. They're a scoffer. Uh, they won't listen uh, to a theological discussion. They mock education. They mock learning. They mock, they mock anything that has anything to do. Uh, they call everything tradition. Oh, it's just tradition. That's tradition. That's tradition. As though... Nothing that is in the Bible has ever been known before. It's all been discovered by only them, and no one's ever been wise before or known anything. And they reject everything. And you know what? The Bible says rebuke not a scorner. I'm not going to spend the time talking to them because you know what scorners do? 
Do they debate? Sure. Debate? Well, yeah, maybe. You know what they really do? They mock. They make fun. They just make fun. They'll make fun of me for being fat. They'll make fun of me for wearing a blue suit. They'll make fun. I really, that really happened one time. I had somebody make fun of my suit. They didn't like what I was preaching. They, they sent me an email and they made fun of my suit. Wow. And uh, you know, it was a perfectly good Goodwill suit too. I, you know, it's amazing somebody would do that. It hurt my feelings. I just want to tell them I'm scarred. You know, <laughs> but that's what a scorner does. What a scorner does, they mock. They make fun of. They'll make fun of your stature. They make fun of things that there's nothing wrong. They can make fun of anything. They can make fun of a person being unwise. They can make fun of you. Oh, you're not going to answer me? You're just going to sit there and be quiet? Yeah, they'll make fun of you for being wise. They're, they're, that's what a scorner does. And so the Bible says, rebuke not a scorner. He that reproveth a scorner getteth himself shame. And he that rebuketh a wicked man getteth himself a blot. A wise person doesn't go out and try to find uh, mockers and try to convince them. He does go out and try to find the wicked and try to convince them. He's just going to get, get a blot on himself. And then verse 9, we see something that's really helpful. And friend, as the Lord has helped me, I've been trying to capitalize on this in the last several years and plan to for the rest of my ministry. Give instruction to a wise man, and he'll be yet wiser. And I'll tell you what, if I see a child or a teenager or a young man or a middle-ager or an older person who's willing to hear the truth of the Word of God, I'll take the time to talk to them. I'll take the time to instruct them, to try to train them, and try to teach them. Because the Bible says a wise man's going to be wiser. So you're here this evening and you say, well, Pastor, you know, I hate to, I hate to be the one to burst your bubble, but uh, the only simple ones in here is everybody but me. And I'm actually kind of wise. Well, the Bible says give instruction to a wise man. So here we're talking about you tonight, too. Uh, give instruction to a wise man, and he'll be yet wiser. Or let's bring that to a different, uh, from a different perspective. What happens when a simple person behaves wise, wisely? What is it? He's wise. And what happens to a wise person when you give instruction to them? They get wiser, right? So you could be simple and you could become wise. And even if you're wise, even if you were simple and you became wise, or even if you just never really been simple, you've always been wise, you can be went wiser by instruction. A wise man will hear and will increase learning, and a man of understanding shall attain under wise counsel. You hear me? A wise man will hear. Boy, I'm under conviction a lot of times when I just go over my conversation uh, with people sometimes, and I realize how much I, how much I speak and how much I listen. And I just think, well, <laughs> either there was one person who was well instructed by me, or maybe. Maybe uh, I missed an opportunity to be wiser. Give instruction to a wise man, he'll be yet wiser. My friend, we have to listen. Listen. If you want to be wise, wisdom is saying, come on, come eat. Home cooked dinner, the best. Fresh meat, fresh, fresh, uh, fresh wine, a uh, beautiful environment. Just a, this, is, this is as good as it can be. And you can come, you're invited. Come to the dinner. Come to the feast. And I'm there. Listen, you invite me to dinner. And, uh, you know, if, if I can make it, I'll be there. And so the Bible says, teach a just man, and he will increase in learning. And so it's another way of saying the same thing. And then where does this all begin? Where do we begin to be wise? Well, look at this. Verse 10, the Bible says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. You say, Pastor, I really don't know. And, and by the way, that, that's probably a good place to start. You know what? I'm not sure what God would say. Because you may have people that you've impressed with your wisdom, right? But what would God say about you? What would God say? If we were to ask the question, are you a wise man based on what God says about you, what would you say? Well, the Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is being in wisdom. And it says the knowledge of the holy is understanding. Let me ask you a question. When we say the knowledge of the holy, what's that mean to you? Some people just think that's a, you know, a book by E.W. Tozer, The Knowledge of the Holy. You know, it is. He wrote a great book, The Knowledge of the Holy. It's a good book. 
A.W. Tozer really spent his whole life trying to know God. And the knowledge of the holy. What is it? What does it mean that God's holy? Knowing God. Well, knowing God. Do you know that as much as I've learned about God, every time I learn something about God, I realize there's so much to learn about God. <laughs> knowledge of the holy. God is unsearchable. He's, he's so vast. And he wants us to find him. He wants us to know him. Matter of fact, James had a relationship with God that uh, he expressed this way. He said, draw nigh to God, and he'll draw nigh to you. In other words, you want to get near God, God will come near you. You go God's direction, God will go your direction. God wants to know you, wants you to know him. So let me ask you a question. Is the knowledge of the Holy is a mysterious secret that no one can know? No, it's something that begins with the fear of the Lord. And then we proceed to get to know Him. Okay. When a guy is really serious about pursuing a woman for marriage, when a guy gets serious about it, I mean, he pulls out all the stops. Here's some things I know about guys that are ready to get married. First of all, it's the only thing they care about. It's the only thing they care about. If a guy is serious about a girl, and you say, hey, I'm thinking about, you know, getting together with some people tonight. You want to get together? And he'll say, no, i got to go home. What are you going to do at home? I'm going to do the laundry. He's not going to He's going home so he can talk to the girl on the phone, right? Why does he want to talk to her? Well, because he wants to spend time with her. And I'm like, why are you laughing? What's so funny about doing laundry? I may have a roommate that's... Oh. <laughs> yeah, maybe so. Didn't okay. Uh, <laughs> hold the camera. Uh, the camera's shaking right now. <laughs> well, uh, i got to go home or I've got to do whatever. You know why? Because he doesn't want to do anything but get to know that lady. You know, um, <laughs> when God showed me that I was supposed to marry Melissa. I want to tell you, I pulled out all the stops. You know what I did? You know what I did? First of all, I just laid my cards out on the table. I told her what it was. I said, we've known each other two weeks now. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's about time to go ahead and let you know uh, what I know. We're going to get married. It was two months, right? Ten weeks? Something like that. It was two months, I think. Almost eight weeks, whatever. It wasn't very long. I mean, honestly, I joke about two weeks. It wasn't very long. It never happened to me before like that. And uh, I knew. I mean, God just said, you're going to marry this girl. So I told her, and she said, you're nuts. It's uh, not going to happen. And I summer crush. There's a million reasons why it won't work. I'm leaving, and it's never going to happen. So I said, because I was interested in this, uh, not only was I interested, I was determined to marry her. You know what I did? I said, well... Uh, would be all right if I call you. Back then, you didn't have unlimited a long distance, so a call meant something. And so she said, well, hey, you can call me, I guess. Yeah, we were good friends. She just didn't want to marry me. And then I said, uh, if I write you, will you write me back? I said, I'll write you. See, hey, man, if you ever want to marry a girl, write her letters. I mean, write her, not emails, not texts, not that. Uh, what it, I'm telling you, you guys, Learn what a ladder is. Do some research. <laughs> Figure out what that is. Learn to write. And, uh, <laughs> start with the ladder. Start with the alphabet. Work your way upwards. <laughs> so I said, she said, here's what she said. She said, okay, but you better not write me every day. She knew I wouldn't write her every day. I don't write letters at all. So you know what I did? I wrote her three times a day. Yes, yes. <laughs> I said, okay, I won't write her again. I wrote her three times a day. I got up in the morning, and I wrote her a letter. And I dropped it in the mail on my way to work. And at lunch, I wrote another letter, and I dropped it in the mail at lunch. And uh, when I went to bed at night, I wrote another letter, and I kept it and dropped it off at the one in the morning. And I went to the mailbox at least once a day, but she literally got in her mailbox the entire time we were dating three letters a day. She has them all somewhere in her suitcase. She's going to sell them. <laughs> I don't know what I said in those letters, but you know what I was doing? I was going after her. Wanted her. And you know what? I got her to marry me really fast, too. We got married. Uh, we met in June of 2000, and we got married July 21st, 
2001. And the only reason it took so long, we were engaged January, uh, December 31st, New Year's Eve, I guess, actually, of, of 2000. So we were engaged to be married. And I talked during the marriage and the whole Shamil, or the whole Shamir, right? <laughs> the whole, the whole uh, the whole ball of wax, whatever you want to call it. We done it. It was all done. And uh, his wife, because I wanted to marry her. I was serious about it. I'd do it again, too. And she says she's going to leave me sometime just so I have to write her to get her to come back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but people did tell you ahead of time for her. Oh, yeah, there was, there was a lot to it. Anyway, I wanted to know her. I wanted to know everything about her. And I, I went in after her. I pursued her. How much of my thoughts, how much of my time do you think I invested into getting to know her. I was pretty well consumed with it. Yeah. I'd hate to have been around me at that time <laughs> because I was probably just as distracted as a lot of people are. I like to think I wasn't, but I probably was. And so the reality of it is, guys, that, that uh, wisdom and understanding are that way. We're supposed to seek her uh, as silk, search for her as for hidden treasure. That's what Proverbs says about uh, wisdom. I've, I've put it this way a couple of times. Matter of fact, Brother, uh, Jim, Brother Mark, why didn't I do this? Uh, we, when we did the fence two weeks ago, I should have told people I buried gold out there. <laughs> and they would have just dug the whole thing up for us and we never had to dig everything up and pull all those roots out. But I didn't. sometimes I'm a little slow, now I'm wiser. Next time I need to do something, I'm going to bury $100 bills places and you're all going to dig everything up. I, I said this at Shamir's school a while back. We, we were meeting out in the courtyard and I told the, the teenagers there, I said, you know, if that, that garden over there, if you knew that there were a couple million dollars in gold that was in the ground there somewhere, hidden or lost in that ground, I said, if work got out, what do you think would happen in that garden? Man, every bit of dirt would be taken out of that thing, wouldn't it? I mean, people would go and they'd go to get it. Well, the Bible says if we seek wisdom as silver and we search for her as for hid treasure, there are prospectors today, not just back in the Old West, who literally spend their whole life looking for silver, looking for gold. I mean, they're just looking for it. They're trying to find it. And there's a learning curve. You know, every prospector, before he finds gold, becomes somewhat of a geologist. And he learns stone, and he fails it, thing after thing after thing. And by the time, by the time he finds gold, a lot of times, <laughs> He's later on in years, later on in life. I mean, that's how that's how uh, much gold fever is in him, how much he wants the gold. Folks, if you go after God that way, and if you go after the knowledge of the holy that way, my friend, it won't be like trying to find gold. You'll actually get God. Matter of fact, tonight, tonight if you go home and you say, God, I'm looking for you, want to find you, and you go to the place where he is, you'll find him. See, God is not inaccessible at all, actually. See, through prayer, we're able to go right into his presence in the throne room of heaven. Through the word of God, we're able to actually have him literally speak to us directly. Through the Holy Spirit of God, he's able to personalize what he shows us in his word. My friend, if you want to, you can be wise. If you want to, if you're wise, you can be wiser. It's one of the most important truths that any person can have. You know, there are Christians that would say things like this, and I don't like this statement, but people say, well, I'm just a lay person. I'm just a regular. I guess a guy, I've had guys say, I'm just a regular guy. And I think, yeah, don't tell me your health habits. I don't want to know that. You know, uh, I'm just, no. Just I'm just a regular guy. No, the reality of it is, is that nobody is just a whatever when you're God's child. You can be wise. You can be wise. You can know God. And there's no such thing as a person who, you know, this guy, you know, God wants this stage of spiritual growth, and this guy, God wants this, and God, this guy, God wants this. No, God says you can have as much as you want. And if you want to be wise, you can be just as wise as you want to, my friend. It's there. It's free. It's for you. And God wants you to have it. Now, isn't that good? Father, thank you for what you've offered us in your word. And I pray that you would convince us of the truth and know that we would search for it. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thanks for your good attention tonight. Now, before we dismiss, I'd like to go ahead and take...
Uh, some prayer requests, if anyone has any that you'd like to share. Yes, Andrew. Uh, 